Welcome to Stargazing, a Stargate gazing podcast. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect. Let's use that one. <laughs> Welcome to Stargazing, a Stargate gazing podcast. I'm your host, Kathy. And I'm your other host, Mary. And every other week, we discuss an episode of Stargate, beginning with Stargate SG-1. How are you? I'm doing okay. I'm very tired. Uh, can't imagine why. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Might have to do with the whole staying up late by a fire. Yeah, and then Thinking I woke here. up at, like, Buddy made me get up at 7.30 and Ugh. feed him. Yeah, he, he's the worst. That is the and worst. And then, like, he was howling, and Aww. then he jumped up on the bed and was bashing his head against my hand, and I was like, fine. And then yeah. I went back to bed and didn't get up till 11. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, our dogs, the dogs let us sleep in until, like, 9. You know that they're tired nice. when they sleep that late. Aww. And they, like, didn't even move. And they've been just zonked out on the couch all day. Aww. They get they get very tired when there's company here, and they were doing so much playing out in the backyard while we were all up there that they're just exhausted today. <laughs> it's pretty great, actually. They're very, <laughs> very snuggly. Coconut was just either sitting on my lap or sitting next to me, um, like all morning as I was working on editing Aww. the podcast that we're putting out this weekend. Yay! She's so cute. She's very cute. Also, Pepper's next to me, so if we pick up any snoring, it's because she's real close <laughs> today because I'm sitting on the couch, and so is she. Fabulous. And hopefully she doesn't demand to get down because that will be a giant pain for me with my current setup. <laughs> hopefully not. Yeah. You could just do it yourself, Squishy. What? That doesn't sound right. Yeah. Why do something yourself when someone else can do it for you? I know. She'll get down on her own, but she likes to get down on the seat I'm on because it's pushed down further than the other cushions, <laughs> so she's like shorter drop to the ground <laughs> oh pepper. pepper and she realizes now i'll pick her up and put her in bed when i go to sleep too so now she lays by my bed and waits <laughs> for me coconut was doing that for a while because she had actually hurt her knee and so we were picking her up or carrying her places and then even though her knee had gotten better and she was fine she still wanted us to pick her up and put her in bed and carry her up the <laughs> stairs after she'd been outside and we're like no dog you, uh, you're you're perfectly fine. You don't need us carrying you around like a little precious bundle that you want to be. But she's so she precious. She was so precious, though, so it was really hard to not. <laughs> it was really. It would have been really easy to just give in and be like, okay, I'm just going to carry you around everywhere forever. And um, we we needed to stop doing that, I suppose. Yeah. So she's gotten back to you being her little independent self. Except for when she requires snuggles, which, as I said, is like all the time, which is great. Yay! Yes. Oh, sorry. Ooh. <laughs> I'll try not to do that too much during this. Thank you. And I'll, if I do, I'll try to make it extremely obvious and dramatic so you know where to like cut it. And I'll try not to do it like mid sentence or. Yes, thank yeah. you. <laughs> cool. I had coffee, but. I did too. I'm actually still drinking coffee. Nice. I've moved on to NA beer. Nice. Because it was either that or water. And I already had some water and I was like, I don't want more water. Mm, that's fair. So. Squishies. And it's NA, so it's okay to be day drinking. Yes. Exactly. Consequence Not free. that I would judge you for day drinking even if it wasn't No, NA, but... but it's, you know, consequence free day drinking, so... Yes. After this, I can get up and go to the grocery store if I want. Although I won't because it's Saturday and I refuse to yeah, leave my I wouldn't, house on Saturdays. I wouldn't either. That's why I went yesterday afternoon, even though I was still technically supposed to be working. Because uh, I'm not going to go on a weekend. No. Too many people. Agreed. Even on a Friday afternoon, there were more people than I would have liked. But So many. Uh, I didn't want to wait until today. I've been having so yeah good luck with Sunday mornings around 9. Oh yeah, no way. It's, it's, a, it's, there's not that many people there that early. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. At least not in my stop and shop. So that's nice. So I've been yeah, trying to good. do that, but that requires I get up and get moving on a Sunday morning, which yeah. sometimes not so great. Right. But was it Happy 10th episode, by the way. Holy cow. 10 episodes. This is our 10th episode. That's amazing. Isn't that exciting? I'm excited. It's very exciting. Yeah. Every 
everyone's excited. We should yeah. have a party if we, we should. Could... Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't the COVID times, maybe yes. we'd have a party. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We'll have a, another party another time. Someday. Someday there will be parties again. Well, I mean, I guess there's t- still technically parties now, but uh, not any kinds of parties that I want to be going to no. in the middle of a pandemic because they tend to be super spreader events. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll yeah. we'll hold off on the party. We'll hold off on parties. Just have our little party here over the the interwebs. Woo! Yay! Huzzah! <laughs> Should have brought a noisemaker. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edit some I'll edit some celebratory noises in. <laughs> Woohoo! Yay! That'll be good. Mini mini online party. Yeah. yeah. So what are we talking about today for our tenth exciting episode we are talking about the torment of tantalus which is a pretty good one yeah i would say uh to celebrate our 10th episode mm-hmm. and this episode we uh we visit the past and we visit a fun planet and it's all good it is i don't know if it's all good but it's kind of good i thought it's good yeah This episode opens with some funky, jazzy, old-timey music, and we are seeing the gate room, but it is clearly not modern-day gate room. Everyone's wearing different uniforms and kind of older-looking khaki outfits. There's a bunch of guys dialing the gate by hand, rather than the computers doing it, as happens in modern day, and there are, like, random scientists studying it, doing science-y things. And then they slowly pan out, and it is hard to explain, but it kind of fades into like an old film type of appearance. And we continue to pan out and see that this is actually now happening on a TV screen. And Daniel is watching it just absolutely mesmerized. I loved this transition. I, yeah, it was actually really cool. I thought they did a nice job yeah. with that. There are a couple really good ones that I enjoyed in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know who was directing this, but... Um... I looked but it up before for a different reason, but now I can't remember their name, and I am <laughs> the worst. Yep, you so, are the worst. I, it's true. Hold on. I actually yeah. think I might that's still have why. a thing up that might have that information. This was directed by Jonathan Glasner. Oh, I have not heard of him before. I've only heard of him in the sense that I've seen his name in the credits for this show. <laughs> <laughs> so Fair. <yeah. laughs> All right. Anyway, O'Neill comes in and tells Daniel that he is supposed to be getting a physical assessment right now, but Daniel is kind of ignoring him and just talking about how he's confused as to why they gave up the research that they were doing on the Stargate. And then he is suddenly stunned because as he's continuing to watch the TV, there's a scene with the wormhole actually open. You can see the event horizon in the wormhole and a guy in an old timey diving suit, like the kind with the air hose, the deep sea diving suit is getting ready to go through the gate and he calls jack back over and he's like look at this look at this and they're trying to figure out well why didn't they tell us about this why did they cover it up and then on the screen we see the gate close the wormhole disappears and the hose that had been attached to the diving suit is completely severed and jack and daniel's reaction is just holy cow and then we get credits yeah very dramatic. I don't know. I enjoyed mm-hmm. that. I thought it was an interesting choice to use the diving gear because the event horizon looks like water. I and... was thinking that too. Yeah. Yeah. Because obviously they didn't have a melp back then. So as far as they knew, he was going to be walking into some water. Yeah. When we come back from the credits, we open on a nice big yellow house with a lovely manicured lawn and a lady and exiting a limo and walking to the house. She's greeted by Martha the maid who calls her Mrs. Langford, which we know from the movie is Catherine Langford, the mm-hmm. basically, I don't know, the mother of Stargate. I don't <laughs> the klepto girl that yes, stole the amulet in the opening scene of the movie. Yeah, and then later recruited Daniel and Yes. Yeah. She has no accent here, which I thought was an interesting choice because she had a pretty heavy accent in the movie but this character does not have an accent at all no no martha tells her there's someone waiting in the kitchen and she's like why would you let someone in (laughs) good question well he said he knows you which still seems a little suspect (laughs) yes that's okay uh so catherine goes in and finds daniel fondling her (laughs) knickknacks 
Uh, <laughs> yep. And she is very pleasantly surprised to see him since she still thought he was on Avidos. Right. Which made me wonder, like, that was supposed to be a top secret mission, and Jack said that Daniel died on Avidos. So did he officially report that Daniel had died, but then still tell Catherine he didn't actually die? He told her Catherine the truth, but just falsified his records everywhere else? That has to be yeah. what happened, because, yeah. Because she's not like, oh my goodness, you're alive. She's like, oh, hey, you're back. Yeah. <laughs> And she still got her stolen amulet from the movie that she wears all the time. Mm-hmm. And so that was basically their little greeting. It was. Back on the base, Jack is going through some old files. They had established before that all of the videos that Daniel was watching and all these files were released recently from the Pentagon. So I think that that's what these boxes are meant to be, although they never actually say Hammond comes in and asks where Daniel is because he was supposed to be briefing SG-4, but didn't show up for it. And Jack has no idea where Daniel happens to be since he is not Daniel's keeper necessarily. And Hammond kind of walks out in a huff. <laughs> oh, Hammond. <laughs> yeah, oh, it, made me think of, it made me think of some of your complaints about <laughs> how Hammond is not doing a good job at leading here. And... Yeah, no, I thought it was just, yeah. It was just kind of funny, like... Keep track of your people, Ham. Right? <laughs> back at Catherine's house, she's really annoyed to learn that Daniel has been back for quite a while, actually, and that they've been going on all of these different missions and that she hasn't been involved in any of this. And Daniel tries to explain, well, it was classified. I couldn't really tell you. And Catherine asks, well, when did you become such an upstanding member of the military? <laughs> and meanwhile, she's continuing to make him some tea in spite of the fact that she's really pissed at him, which I thought was... A kind of funny choice. Sometimes you just gotta make tea. Sometimes yeah. you just have to make some anger tea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It'll calm her down. Yes. But Daniel is also irritated himself because he wants to know why she never told him about all of the research that had been going on back in 1945. Catherine explains that her father was heading up the research team on the gate during the war and that they didn't actually know what it was, but that Roosevelt was really curious and thought that it might be some kind of a weapon, so they were trying to figure out what it was and how it works. So at this point, Catherine mentions that she didn't know a whole lot about the research that was happening back in the 1940s when her father was heading it up, and that she only knows what she overheard her father and Ernest talking about. Oh man, who's this Ernest? Don't know. We'll probably find out. Yes. <laughs> I was a little confused here because Catherine claims that she didn't know a whole lot about the research going on then, but then at some point later she was heading up the research that was going on. So I guess that was that was more closer to modern day, though. Is that right? Yeah, it sounded like from all of their conversations that they had this they had this experiment that nobody knows about in the 40s, yeah. and then they shut down the program for decades, and yeah. it took Catherine a really long time to get anyone to take her seriously i think mm-hmm. because there was some point in there she said something about going to multiple administrations so it sounds like right. she's been working at this for a while so then when she got it reopened she was heading it at that point right it yeah. wasn't she wasn't heading it like after her father and then they shut it down and then she was petitioning and that's not how it worked right i don't think so okay yeah. i just wanted to clarify that for myself and also anyone listening that's trying to also figure out that timeline yeah all right uh, and that's pretty much it for that scene we're treated to another nice transition where she turns her head to look into another part of the room and we pan over and we are then in the past in that room and two people are sitting by the fire, presumably Catherine and <laughs> Ernest. <laughs> One could assume. He's talking about the gate research and he talks about how the room shook when the fifth symbol was locked in and then today they even had a generator explode because of the gate's power whatever and she wants to know she's not interested really in that she's like have you talked to dad and i'm assuming this is about the relationship they are clearly yes. having right <laughs> <laughs> that was the implication yeah. and then we kind of get a full look at Ernest, who is played in the past by paul mcgillan who will go on to be a main character in stargate atlantis Oh, really? Is he, that why he looks so familiar? Yeah, he plays Dr. Carson Beckett, the Scottish guy. Hi. He also possesses many valuable herbs and spices and gourds. Oh, seriously? Yes. Oh, no way. Yeah. 
why does he look so different? He looks really different. I didn't recognize him at all. And obviously I've seen Atlantis and I like his character yeah. in that. I'm surprised I didn't recognize him. I just thought he looked vaguely familiar. I think it, it took me a while because yeah. I was, it, I think it's, you're not hearing his accent either. Yeah. So, I and he's got the glasses that yeah. he doesn't have in that, <laughs> you know, like Superman. Right. <laughs> Clark Kent and Superman aren't the same people. No. Apparently, I could also have been fooled by that disguise. <laughs> you are Superman. Oh, Lois, come on. Go me. <laughs> well, anyway, um, presumable Ernest uh, says he promises he promises to talk to uh, her father. But then they go back to talking about the gate. Yes. Catherine says that maybe the gate is supposed to do the shaking. And she lays down some electrical knowledge that she's been holding on to and tells him to try a direct current rather than an alternating current to prevent the charge from bouncing back and exploding. <laughs> so that sounds like sound advice. It does. But he's kind of like silly girl. Yeah. <laughs> he's really dismissive of her, which I thought was insulting i would also wonder like maybe they should have some scientists in the room who know that kind of thing and maybe even try that but yeah maybe right, they do think. maybe he's just humoring her could be he promises again to talk to her father and then they, there's some kizzy kizzies <laughs> back in present day Catherine says that she doesn't know where the files from the original experiments were kept and all she knew is that she had her father's notes but she didn't even realize that there were any other secret files otherwise she would have been angling them to get released to her much earlier than now. She does say here that she'd been trying to reopen the gate for 40 years, and it was mostly without success until that last period of time right before the movie takes place. Daniel says, you didn't actually know they turned the gate on in 1945, and Catherine looks completely shocked to be hearing this for the first time. What? <laughs> uh, they go back to another flashback, and... Ernest is talking to a guy that we can presume is Catherine's dad here, and they're at a table talking about the gate. Ernest says that, well, if it's a combination lock, why would they put 39 symbols on it? Because that means that there's millions of combinations that would be possible. And dad is like, well, what are you saying then? Ernest says he thinks that they are not combinations like to a lock, but that they would actually be destinations instead. And that in dialing the gate and getting the wormhole that they apparently just got, he believes that they've found one of those destinations. Catherine's father says, well, we don't really know that that necessarily goes anywhere, so we can't assume that it's a gate. It could just be that anyone that passes through it dies instantly. At this point, Catherine comes in with some tea and snacks, and her dad is really dismissive, saying, we have a maid for a reason. Catherine gives Ernest a meaningful look before leaving the room. I sort of got the impression, too, that her father already knew there was something going on there. Yeah. He was looking at them and, like, and I wasn't sure if their whole relationship was secret or if they had decided, like, they want to be engaged and he needs to, like, do the, like, ask dad for permission right. thing. But dad already knew about the relationship. Not, anyway. Yeah. Not made clear. He gives them a knowing look, though. Yeah. And then we get another great transition back where <laughs> her father presumably reaches for the sugar cubes for the tea. And then we are back in the future where Catherine is grabbing sugar cubes to drop into her tea yes. using the same, same tea set. Yes. Yeah, that was a nice transition yeah. too. She says she never knew about the gate. And then Daniel pops in a VHS <laughs> I know, that made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> we got to hear the sweet sound of a tape going into a VCR, which is a, a dying sound, I think, that will only be preserved on, you know, tape in the future. Or... Did it give you flashbacks of all your time working at the video store? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then he wa she watches the same footage of Ernest going through the gate. And she that's at that point she actually confirms the guy going through the gate was Ernest oh, at yes. that because before that Daniel hadn't known who that was. That is true. I yeah. didn't think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Although how she could really tell because he was in his diving bell, I'm not really sure. Did they show his face before they put the helmet on? I think I they remember. I think they did. I okay. I think so. But you know, also maybe like that was his special diving suit, like that she be. just recognizes because he brings it everywhere with him. Yeah, you know, like you do. Yeah. <laughs> So we flash back quickly to the past where Catherine's father comes in and relays that there was an explosion at the gate and that Ernest died. 
and then back in present day where she literally says what we just saw and explains that her her dad probably lied to protect her feelings since clearly Ernest has chosen his work over her and she also says that Daniel reminds her of Ernest that they're both very passionate about their work and that's how she knew that he would solve the puzzle of the Stargate. Daniel says he's not supposed to show her something, even though he's shown her, like, all the things already. Right. <laughs> Everything else is fine to show you, yeah. but this one thing that I'm going to show you... I mean, they did say the other stuff was declassified. Yeah. <laughs> so so now everyone can know about the gate, I guess, technically, I which guess. seems like an odd choice since they're still actively doing top secret research on it. But Maybe okay. they only declassified it to the level that Daniel's allowed to see it? I don't know yeah. how that... <laughs> I don't know how exactly how declassified it is, right? Is yeah. it completely declassified, or is it just a lower tier of secrecy? Yeah, I can't. Im- I can't imagine that they could have actually just outright mm-hmm. declassified it because, right? This, yeah, it's related to what they're what they're doing now. That is super secret. Yes, Daniel. What he's showing her are actually images of the gate address that was dialed in 1945, and they note the similar coordinates to Abydos. And Daniel's like, we can go there. (gasps) What? (laughs) He's very uh, optimistic about this. He is, quite. Especially because it seems like later, like, it's not something they've already, like, tested, so... (laughs) Yeah, they haven't actually dialed it to make sure that there's still a gate there, like a functioning gate. He's just assuming. But, yeah. But he, he, he teases that one. Woo! Yep. So back at the base, I forgot about this scene when we were just talking about it, but Hammond was super angry (laughs) at Daniel for telling a civilian classified information. So yeah, I guess it was only kind of partially declassified. O'Neill comes in to smooth things over and calls to Hammond a big teddy bear. Says he's really not (laughs) as mean and grumpy as he's seeming. Talking to Catherine at the time because now she's back on the base with him. Hammond asks if Jack gave Daniel permission to talk to Catherine, and Jack is like, of course I wouldn't do something like that, even though she used to run the program, and all of the knowledge that we currently have about the gate is pretty much because of her. (laughs) At this point, Tilk and Catherine are introduced, and Hammond asks if Jack knows of Daniel's current request, which is, of course, to try to go to that planet. Daniel says that Ernest was Catherine's fiancé, and that they really need to go back and look for him. Because even though it's been 50 years, maybe he's still around. And Catherine insists that if they do this, she is going to go with them. I have a little uh, diversion here. Yes. In this scene, Hammond, when he's asking about, you know, do you know about this latest request Daniel's made? Mm -hmm. He uses the word tabled. I'm trying to find it in a transcript I pulled up and now I can't. Uh But so he said something like, do you know about this latest request that Daniel has tabled? And it, to me, that reads oh. as, like, yeah. putting away the discussion for later. Right. So I looked this up. <laughs> so you table the, in every other part of the world except the United States means to <laughs> put on the table for a discussion, whereas <laughs> ours is to postpone it for later. But since this show is supposedly taking place with a bunch of Americans, I would have thought they would have used it in the American sense, but it was right. also written by Canadians. But, so... Yeah, and filmed in Canada, too, <laughs> yeah, actually. So... So that is why that was confusing for me for quite a while oh. till Wikipedia set me right. That's interesting. Thank you for looking into that. I, could, I, I didn't even really notice it myself. I think I was having trouble hearing something and I was like, what is he saying? Is he oh, saying okay. table? And I'm like, what? Yeah, I think I just continued on and uh, was t- busy with my notes and didn't really even, it didn't even really register to me. So that's cool. Interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, so Catherine says that she is going to go with them if they go to look for him. Daniel is continuing to try to argue that they need to go to this planet because Ernest was a brave hero and they need to go find him if there's any chance at all of bringing him back home. Carter comes in at this point and says that there's another reason to go as well because this planet was near Abydos, which is how they were managed to dial it back in 1945, even though they hadn't learned how to accommodate for the planetary shift yet that they mentioned a few episodes back. But the planet isn't on the cartouche on Abydos that Daniel had been studying for so long that had all of the known gate addresses on it. So it's possible that the Gua'uld had never even studied this planet before, or never even knew that this planet was there. Otherwise, they would have documented it on that other cartouche. Daniel says that this could prove that the Gua'uld did not actually build the gate if there is, in fact, a gate that they didn't know about. 
And Tilk says that this could help them find a technology to use against the gold if they've never been to this planet and never had access to any weapons that they might have. And Catherine suddenly chimes in, oh, so you, you speak? speak? <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was kind of rude. Yeah. <laughs> because when they were introduced, Tilk didn't actually say anything. He just smiled and gave her a pleasant nod. So his response here is, when, when it's is appropriate. appropriate. <laughs> and Hammond says that he was already convinced by Daniel anyway, so they didn't really need to keep this whole line of argument going. Because he agrees with Daniel when he said that Ernest is a hero and that they really should go look for him for that reason. Yeah. Next, we're in the gate room. We've got the wormhole whooshing <laughs> open. Daniel and Jack are on either side of Catherine and their arms are linked. Teal can Sam in the supply shuttle go ahead and go through and then the three of them approach. Uh, <laughs> Catherine is pretty so, apprehensive. This was making me laugh because I was thinking about how they flew through and all tucked and rolled in the last yes! episode, which we were talking about. And I was like, oh man, if she is as fragile as she's seeming to look here, then this isn't going to end well for her. <laughs> no. And that's why I think they're linked like that. Because I, I at first I thought it was moral support, but I think it's actually yes. physical support they're providing her. I'm sure that that's, that is the case. But also the way that they lined up, like right in front of the gate, each of them holding one hand and their other hands behind her back, it looked like they were about to pick her up and throw her through. <laughs> <laughs> so that also is making me laugh. <laughs> That would be, that'd be a, a, like a really horrible hazing that they do yes. to people new to the gate. But it would be especially terrible to do to a poor elderly woman. Yes. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So Catherine looks a little apprehensive and Jack's yes. like, it's a piece of cake. And they smile and they hold hands and they go through. And they don't end up falling and tucking and rolling when they get to the yeah. other planet. It's a little bit of a forceful entrance, but it's just kind of one big quick step and then they catch themselves after they come through. Yeah. They're in some kind of an old temple and looking around the place, it looks like it's collapsing. There's dust coming down from the ceiling and there's just like fallen over beams and columns and rocks everywhere. And they comment about how hot it is. Jack asks if there is any way out of the place and Tilk says there are only two doorways. Which I thought was weird because does that mean, doesn't that imply that, yeah, there's two doorways. <laughs> you can get out that way. But the way Teal said it, it was like, no, there's only two doorways. <laughs> so I thought that was weird. A little bit. Yeah. Suddenly Sam says, oh, oh my. my. <laughs> and it turns out that there's an old naked guy standing in one of those doorways. <laughs> so Daniel approaches and asks if that's Dr. Littlefield and uh, calls him by his first name, Ernest. The old guy comes up and approaches them looking really confused and apparently still has his glasses from back in the day hanging on a string around his neck. So he puts them up to his face and gets a really close look at Daniel and then suddenly cries and starts hugging everybody, mm. saying that it's about time. And I really liked Sam's reaction here because she just says, oh boy, and then <laughs> rapidly backs out of his reach as he's going around yeah. hugging everybody. <laughs> Understandable that she doesn't want to be hugged by a naked old man. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Catherine is hanging out by the gate and Ernest didn't notice her until Daniel points her out. And so Ernest looks over, stares at her for a second, not really seeming to recognize her, and then just says, hmm, and walks away. And Catherine looks really sad. Aw. I guess I really liked how this episode was shot. I really yeah. liked them bouncing between like the the elderly man sort of approaching them and their like reaction faces as he got yeah. closer <laughs> <laughs> and then it was really nice like when he like burst into tears and like hugged daniel i was like oh yeah it was pretty cute poor old guy <laughs> next uh we got a quick exterior shot of this temple or structure or whatever it is it's on the very edge of a cliff above the ocean and water's doing its thing and <laughs> Yes, it is. The structure is now on the verge of falling in due to the erosion of the cliffside. And then we go back in. Daniel is walking down some steps. So he's exited the room through one of the two entryways that Teal described as existing. <laughs> yes. So he goes into another room and there's some light in there. You can hear the thunder in the background and he's looking around at the walls. Ernest seems to pop out of nowhere. 
and he's just sitting there in a corner yeah. it's weird <laughs> and daniel's like do you got some clothes man and <laughs> Ernest pulls out like this raggedy cloth thing that he's is basically like a dress he puts over his head and it was it took me a second to realize it but it was the remnants of his diving suit oh thank you i didn't yeah. know i was like where did that come from what's going mm-hmm. on okay interesting yeah so yeah. he's he's got some clothes left um, I mean, I guess if I were hanging around, not doing anything, and it was really hot, there'd be, and no one was around, why would I bother with? Yeah, clothing? right. Bother. Yeah, <laughs> can't blame him. But yeah. now he's got company, so yeah, he yeah. should be wearing he, something. And he throws it on. <laughs> he throws it on. Yep. Um, and asks if they're he, they're going home, and Daniel says, actually, yes. And then he he's wondering, did nobody try to find me? And Daniel says, that's a long story. And I was, and that's actually an answer we never get. Like, did they yeah. immediately just shut down the program after? Did they never try to dial back again and see what right. happens? That's kind of the impression yeah. that we get, but we don't, we don't really ever find out for sure. They didn't know what it was, so it it does seem a little cruel to have not done anything. But they also didn't know what happened to him. So, right. But maybe even just like pass some paper and a pen through and be like, "Hey, are you still there, buddy?" And then they could, like, pass messages through that way, even maybe. if they didn't want to send another person. But apparently they never did that. Yeah. I mean, maybe they just thought he had, like, drowned because they thought True. it was water. I don't know. Although, even if they had done that, we, as we're going to be learning, they, he wouldn't have been able to pass anything back through True. anyway. Because wormholes are only one way, so Ernest would have had to dial back in. He wouldn't have just been able to yes. toss it back through and have it come back without being able to use the DHD on that planet. Daniel asks if there are if there's anyone else there and Ernest says there's no one and hands Daniel some dark black ball while Daniel is realizing that he Ernest has been alone this whole time. Yeah, that's and a long time. He's very alone. stunned. And Ernest wants to hit to eat this black ball, so I guess it's food. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> Back in the gate room, this this planet's gate room, Catherine isn't really sure what she was expecting, but says that after 50 years, she was really hoping for more than that reaction that she just got. And she is talking about how she can't believe that he was just right here this whole time, so close and yet so far. And Sam is kind of trying to console Catherine, saying that he's probably just having trouble dealing with it after being alone for 50 years and suddenly seeing the love of his life and a bunch of other people show up kind of out of nowhere and Catherine says that she feels like a schoolgirl, and that she had thought that she was old and wise and doesn't really know why she is feeling the way that she is and sam says that she doesn't think the heart really ever grows old oh can't Catherine can't imagine what Ernest must have been through being alone here for 50 years and says she doesn't really even know him anymore after all that time so sam suggests that maybe she should go talk to him Back in the other room with Ernest and Daniel, Ernest has given him some ancient parchment with a bunch of um, what I think is tally marks, and I think this is meant to be Ernest keeping track of his time there, because Daniel says this is kind of a calendar, and Ernest says yes. That was my yeah. conclusion as well. Daniel asks if Ernest has any idea who lived there, and Ernest is having trouble putting full sentences together, but his speech does kind of recover as we go throughout the episode but he says heliopolis so daniel repeats that back and says he knew of an ancient city by that name that was dedicated to Ra, and asks if there are any hieroglyphs around that represent Ra. Ernest goes to get an old journal and daniel reads it out loud saying there are four distinct languages different from anything on earth catherine says they are probably aliens and then he's like catherine says and Ernest says well she found me a long time ago which doesn't really seem to match up with anything that we've known so far about Catherine not knowing he was still alive. So Daniel is, of course, stunned by that piece of information and continues reading about how Ernest and Catherine had walked for miles and miles but didn't find any sign of any civilization. But Ernest was apparently happy with her there anyway, just the two of them. At this point, Catherine comes in and says that her father lied to her. And Daniel excuses himself to let them talk. Mm. And Ernest is like, you're real? You look different. (laughs) Of course she looks different. It's been 50 years. So Catherine says, yeah, we're old. (laughs) 
Ernest says that they had had a wonderful life there together, or at least in his mind, imagining it as he was. And that's why he was writing it as though it were real. Catherine says that she didn't have the opportunity to imagine a wonderful life together because from her perspective, he was dead. And Ernest says, but you forgave me for that a long time ago. And Catherine says, no, I didn't. And then it was really sad oh. because Ernest started crying. It was. I was like, don't make the sad old man cry. I know. <laughs> it was really sad. At the same time, like, she should drop some truth on him since he clearly lives in a fantasy world, which is not his fault, but... Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aww. And then we just get a quick flashback out to the cliffs and there's lightning. Is that like sparkles? Yeah. And then we come back into the building. Jack and Teal have been doing some wandering because they come in and report there seems to be nobody else on this planet. Because this one building is the whole planet? I guess. I mean, they clearly <laughs> didn't explore the whole planet because no, that I would know. be crazy. But <laughs> yeah. Or it'd be the tiniest planet ever. And that just doesn't make any sense. But anyway, they, are, they conclude there's no one around yeah. anyway. Yes. And they thought the place used to be pretty, what did he say, pretty sweet. Yeah, back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> but it has seen better days. Daniel comes in and reports that Ernest has you know, been here all alone since he got here. Jack and Teal'c uh, say there's a big storm coming. Uh, and Ernest, uh, Ernest reveals it's a yearly storm. And mm -hmm. Jack is pretty adamant that they've got to get out of here or they're all going to fall in the ocean and die. <laughs> that would be an unpleasant end. And Daniel is show yeah. over, series over. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a fun run, Kathy. It was a great Should run. We, uh, yeah, move on to S uh, Stargate Atlantis. Yes, I think so. <laughs> I mean, there's no more SG1 after this. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel objects to going home because he wants to explore this place. Jack's like, "Well, we left behind a survey balloon, which I guess is is that a weather thing? I don't know. I think so. Yeah." I was that was my impression. Yeah, and so and they can, you know, they can check back in and come back once the storm is gone if yeah. if they can. They need to get the olds to safety. Uh, <laughs> I don't think he said that, but <laughs> that was my impression. No, but, but but I like it. Okay. <laughs> Ernest gestures to the DHD that we haven't really paid any attention to so far, saying he tried to make it work and Daniel Set, you know, asks. He's a little like, condescending. I felt in this, like you never tried to uh -huh. press any buttons. Yeah, um, <laughs> and then, he's like, it's just right here. We call this the DHD yeah. or dial home device. He was really, yeah. It was like, and you can yeah. use it to go home. And like, yeah, <laughs> he was really dumbing it down for this guy who's clearly who was pretty brilliant back in the day. So it was pretty condescending. Yeah, <laughs> but. Daniel starts to is trying to explain how it works to him, and Jack's like, "Why don't we just show him?" Yeah. <laughs> but then they all walk around to the DHD, which they haven't looked at because it's kind of up on a little pedestal, set right. pretty far back in the room, and they, so they didn't notice that. <laughs> Whoops. The big red button is smashed in. Yes. So it's not working. Daniel like fruitlessly taps on some symbols, and it does nothing. Their probe didn't doesn't detect that because it looks like it's only a visual probe that they're using anyway. So unless yeah. it wheeled around, yeah. Jack asks, doesn't the MALP get confirmation that these things are here? But Sam says that it's only visual confirmation. It's not like actually sensing to see whether or not it's active, yeah. but just that it's there. Maybe they will change their their procedures. Yeah, change their SOPs moving forward. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not since. Well, I mean, again... I have a feeling they won't, the, but... You know. you know, this device is broken, so they just fall in the ocean. Yeah. So, yeah, they won't. There's no procedure to change. <laughs> and then, then that's it, and we move on to Stargate Atlantis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Ernest says it's been broken since he got there, and oh my god, they can't go home. Thunder and dust and dramatic music. Yes, I also wrote about the dramatic music. <laughs> We get yet another view of the cliffs and the lightning, and I'm pretty sure that this is the same cutscene every single time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Back inside, most of the team is exploring, although Teal'c and Sam are trying to fix the dial home device. Ernest shows everybody, except for the two of them, to another room that has another kind of device, and he uncovers it and it lights up, as do a bunch of panels in the wall. 
that all look like they have some kinds of different writing on them. And Daniel reads from the journal. Ernest believed that it was a meeting place for four different alien races to share knowledge and discuss issues, kind of like a UN of the stars. And apparently imaginary Catherine agreed with that assessment. And real Catherine says, yes, I would have. <laughs> Back in the gate room, Sam and Tilk are trying to figure out how to power the DHD and maybe they can dial the gate manually if they can at least get it to power enough to open the wormhole. And then we're back in the, I called it the glowy room. Nice. Um, <laughs> Jack touches that big red button on this other device <laughs> and we are treated to a light show. Yes. And we see a bunch of orange blobs and smaller blue blobs floating around the orange blobs high in the air and a bunch of different ones. Yes. Jack recognizes something in, I think, was it Ernest who identified it as hydrogen? Or was that somebody mm -hmm. else? Uh, uh, I don't remember. Somebody recognizes it as hydrogen. Yeah. And then they all start like pointing out a bunch of different elements as made by these orange and blue blobs. Yes. And Ernest says he's been here a long time, so he knows the most of them. If this were a contest. <laughs> <laughs> And Jack says, you know, something about it being comic things. Atomic things. <laughs> Which are, yeah. I was like, come on. I mean, like, I know he's not a science person, but even if he's had basic chemistry, he should know what an atom yeah. is. <laughs> he's, he's playing dumb. Yes. So, yeah. So this is basically we're looking at elements. Yes. Created in a visual form. Right. That I would never recognize. I don't have that sort of ability to have recognized them. <laughs> oh, really? Or skill. I don't know. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've done any uh, studying of chemistry. Yeah, that's like fair. High school. <laughs> yeah, I did actually think, I didn't remember for sure that they were elements, but that's actually what I was thinking they looked like when they came up. But also I'm teaching chemistry right now. Nice. So. <laughs> Check out the ones they call the elements. It's <laughs> a good song. Ernest has identified 146 elements, yes. which they're like, holy cow, there's only 111 in, I'm going to say, 1997 or so. Yeah, we have 118 now. Yeah. And then he, Ernest is like, well, there are only 19 and 90 in 1945. <laughs> 19, wow. Yeah. No, there was more than that. <laughs> <laughs> they're kind of, they're just, they're examining them and just kind of talking it out. And mm -hmm. Daniel has a flash of inspiration that these elements as the basic building blocks of all life is a universal mode of communication. Yeah. Catherine had said something about how they've only speculated what an atom <sighs> looks like and the fact that four alien races all thought they looked almost identical to our idea kind of confirms that our theory was correct or she seemed kind of incredulous that all of the races would guess that they look the same. But I would think if these races were so advanced they would actually probably have confirmation that this is what they look like yeah Ernest tells them to turn the page which apparently means you just touch the red button again and then the light yeah. show changes yes which is pretty cool he's tried to understand this the entire time he's here and Daniel's like it could take a lifetime so insensitive because Ernest is like more and Daniel's like oops sorry <laughs> He also thinks this could be the key to understanding existence. Holy cow. The answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything is... Forty-two. Ernest mentions it's a collaboration of knowledge between these four species. And then Jack brings them back to reality and is like it doesn't matter if we're all gonna get stuck here and probably fall in the ocean right if they can't share that knowledge with anyone then it, it doesn't really it's not really worth having yeah back in the gate room sam and tilk have completely stripped the map apart and are using the parts to run a wire from the dhd directly to the gate trying to use the power source in the dhd to get the gate to turn on jack comes back in and tells Sam that Daniel was showing off some new toy that may be the key to the existence and Sam seems surprisingly disinterested in that <laughs> you would think that she would be fascinated by that given her science background yeah. she should be completely fascinated that they're using the elements as a language although he doesn't actually say that I feel like maybe she's just being practical and like the first thing is first gotta do this yeah. thing 
I don't know. Or true, yeah. but like she doesn't even react though. She's that's not true. even like, wow, that's amazing. But I need to do this. She's just like, <laughs> okay, whatever. <laughs> she just wasn't really listening. Doesn't care. That's entirely possible. Yes. Oh, Jack's talking again. Yeah. No. <laughs> Jack's saying more stuff. <laughs> There is more thunder and some dust falls from the ceiling and Jack asks Sam to pick up the pace a bit. Sam connects some wires and the gate powers on for like a second, but then immediately dies and a bunch of rocks fall and Jack manages to pull Sam out of the way just before the rocks fall on the DHD where Sam had been standing and in, in diving out of the way they'd fallen down. And so they stand back up and look around and apparently the DHD has fallen through a very nice little perfectly shaped hole in the floor yeah. and down into the ocean below womp, yeah womp. i liked the uh the severed wire there so because it kind of called back the severed yeah. wire at the beginning when ernest yep. is trapped to begin yes. with daniel and ernest are in the heliopolis room daniel is examining a symbol on the wall and he realizes that's how ernest knows what this place was he recognized the symbol they call it othala and say it's a Norse rune representing the collection of knowledge and power of previous generations. I looked up Othala. I'm a little yeah. sorry I did. Because oh. <laughs> apparently it was one of those uh, symbols that was a little bit perverted by the Nazis. Ah, uh, gotcha. Because it, you know, it talks about your, like, special Aryan past or whatever. But they, mm -hmm. they manipulate the symbol a little bit where the little ends of it tip up and like i don't know anyway i was yeah. a little sad about that there are other meanings of it or there's other uses but stupid nazis yes um <laughs> agreed nazis are very stupid yeah. Ernest is like this guy this has to be more than a coincidence humans were here centuries ago clearly referring to recognizing this ruin and daniel's like actually not humans but aliens and reveals that thor was an alien and what? I know. And he says it's another long, good story. Yes. And then we're back in the other room with the gate. Mm -hmm. The gate room. The yeah. gate room, yeah. And Jack is trying to assess what they're, what's going on. And so he's like, well, we know what we have and what we need, right? And Jack says, <laughs> and Jack says they have the Stargate and need the DHD. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, oh, Teal'c, I love you, yeah, man. I liked, I liked that scene. <laughs> Sam says the gate absorbs energy directly, and if there's enough power built up in the gate, they can spin, spin the ring without the DHD and dial home. So Jack's like, well, we need energy. Woo! But sadly, they have none. No. At the moment. Yes. Anyway. Back in the other room, Daniel is trying to take pictures of all the glowy elements on the ceiling, but is complaining that his camera doesn't allow for relative perspective. Ernest and Daniel are trying to discuss some other measurements that they can maybe use for comparison with the floor and distance and height. The rest of SG-1 comes in and Daniel is very unhappy to hear that they plan to take the power source from this device to try to power the gate because this is meaning of life stuff, as he says. 42. And he's kind of grasping at straws trying to persuade them not to disassemble this thing. But they insist and tell him he needs to step aside. And then for some reason, they blast it with Teal'c's staff. Why? I didn't really understand no. why that was their method of trying to take the energy source out of it. I no had no idea. No idea. <laughs> yeah, that made no sense. Like, you're risking destroying your energy source by doing that, I would think. But to them, that apparently seemed to make sense. <laughs> anyway, it didn't work. It didn't do anything. And so Daniel asks, well, now what? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just like they also just gave up after that. Like, yeah, they're like, all right, I guess that's it. That's not gonna work. <laughs> just, just, just make any sense. It was a weird scene. Yeah. <laughs> so at this point, we hear thunder overhead and loud creaking noises, and Jack's like, "Well, why don't we use that Ben Franklin thingy?" And I, I actually had no idea what he was talking oh. about with that reference. <laughs> But, I mean, obviously I got it later, yeah. but at the time I was like, what Ben Franklin thingy? Well, that's funny, too, because I wasn't thinking about Ben Franklin, but watching them with, like, the cables and stuff, and I was like, this looks like Back to the Future, when Doc yes. Brown is trying to get the lightning to strike, or he knows the lightning's going to strike the tower, and needs to wield the power to get his 1.21 gigawatts! 1.21 gigawatts! <laughs> Back in the gate room, the team comes in, and Sam explains to them that maybe they can harness the lightning to power the gate. 
And Teal'c asks how they're going to attract the lightning, but Sam says they can rig something up on the roof, and hopefully it won't destroy the dialing mechanism if it's too powerful. <laughs> and then we get a nice little science montage. <laughs> Catherine then comes in and says that Daniel is refusing to leave the other device in the other room. And Ernest, who at this point is speaking better than he had been and is kind of using more complete sentences, describes the situation as the temptation of Tantalus and that Daniel may be grasping for what is out of his reach. Catherine says, maybe that's what makes a man great. And Ernest replies that maybe he should just be happy with what he has and says that he himself was a fool back in the day, implying that he was a fool for not realizing what he had with Catherine and risking all of that. But Catherine says that there's no point worrying about the past. And then Ernest picks up his old diving helmet and goes off to tell Teal'c that they should put that on the roof to try to catch the lightning, while Ernest himself then goes back to get Daniel. In the other room, Daniel and Ernest are arguing, and Ernest is trying to explain that no prize is worth attaining if you can't share it with anybody. There's no point, believe me, I know, he says. In the gate room, the team is waiting impatiently for Daniel and Ernest to come back, and we get our cutscene outside where lightning hits the helmet, electricity travels down the very safe wires to the gate <laughs> with lots of sparks and drama, and Teal'c starts dialing out. Yeah. Jack goes for them both and says, we gotta go, and Daniel's still being a dumbass about staying. <laughs> He's like, oh, I'll be fine. And Jack's like, no, the whole thing's coming down. <laughs> Daniel still refuses to go, and Jack's like, you're gonna be in the ocean, dude, and I don't know why I'm saying it like this. <laughs> I mean, it is, yeah. it's the basic gist. <laughs> and Jack basically, Jack starts to manhandle Daniel up the yes. stairs. Ernest has already taken off and left. Yeah. He's, he he's headed. He's not willing to stay and die for this. Right. Can't blame him having been there for 50 yeah. years and having an out. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel pleads with Jack to let him go, which he does. And then Daniel takes a final look around the room and just grabs the journal and comes to his senses and leaves the room. Yeah. Yes. It's about fucking time. Seriously. Back at the gate, which is dialed up and ready, Catherine is telling Ernest it's a piece of cake. Ernest is like, I don't remember it that way, but okay. And they go through. Yeah. And then Teal and Sam are waiting for the other two. And the other two are having a bumpy journey back to the gate. Yes, they are. Yes. At least twice they nearly miss being conked in the head by falling stones. And Jack tells Sam to go, so she goes through. And then we have, like, a dramatic wait, because then we're back at the SGC. Yes. Yeah. We get a brief scene where it looks like the ceiling is collapsing, and it's hard to tell whether or not Jack and Daniel are okay. And Sam has gone through, and we see a flash to the gate room of Sam waiting in the foreground while Hammond and uh, a bunch of other people are waiting up in the control room. And one thing I wanted to mention here is that a couple episodes, you and I had talked about how when those guys during the Broken Divide were fighting and they fell out the window and they made it look like a big dramatic fall. And you and I were talking about how it's like 30 feet above the ground. Yeah. But in this scene, there's a guy standing right under the window and the top of his head comes up to the bottom of the window. So it's oh. only actually like six feet off the ground, maybe. Oh, man. But that other episode made it look like they had fallen this huge distance rather than just a couple feet. Yeah. And didn't that dude die from that fall? Like, yeah, that... I think he did. <laughs> maybe that guy hit his head real hard or something. Maybe. Anyway, they mention here that the wormhole is destabilizing and there's more suspenseful waiting to see if Jack and Daniel are going to come through. Back on the other planet, Jack and Daniel get up out of the rubble, so apparently they are okay. And we go back to the Earth Gate and Jack and Daniel tuck and roll through the gate. This time it actually made sense for them to have leapt <laughs> through and be tucking and rolling as they land back yes. on the next planet. <laughs> and the gate closes right after them. Whew! So close. <laughs> so close. Yeah. At an indeterminate point later, the gate is dialing. I don't know if they... I didn't check to see if they were all in their same clothes or anything like that. No, I, I don't think I didn't so. Um, but anyway, they're, they're trying to dial the gate, but they can't. They can't reach the planet. They assume yeah. the planet. Yeah. Or at least the gate is, is gone is at gone. this point. Yeah. Daniel... They console Daniel. He's got the book. And they've got Sam, who's off already sciencing about this. Of course. And his life. So, yeah, all good. Things. Yeah, which Daniel thanks Ernest for uh, 
his perspective and getting through to Daniel. And they say, you know, maybe one day we'll meet these aliens and they can actually tell us what all of that stuff was that they didn't get to learn. That meaning yes. a lot of his stuff, whatever. 42. And there's, you know, kind of hugs all around with everybody. So we've got a little happy ending. Uh, Catherine and Ernest are smiling and hugging and it's so sweet. And what happens to them? We don't know because that's where the episode ends. <laughs> Roll to credits. Roll to credits. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. That was the end. So we've already mentioned that we liked this episode. Yes. Any, anything in particular that you want to say that you did like about it? Um, I there I feel like there was a ton of to like about this episode. I yeah. clearly really enjoyed, which I didn't really notice. I enjoyed the directing quite a lot, which kind of came out as we talked about it. There was just there was a lot to this episode. Like it was there was a lot yeah. of. It felt like it could have today. It probably would have been drawn out into like multiple episodes with way more dramatic scenes. Um, with today's TV. I don't know. Yes. And I liked how the two kind of different things that were happening in the scene, like this rescuing this old guy, but then also trying to find this information is really tied through Daniel's obsession with knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I also really liked, so I, I, I said before, like, I don't know what happens, you know, we don't know what happens with Catherine and Ernest, but I liked their mm -hmm. whole, like, Oh, lost love story, and then they find each other. But yeah. you know, I don't think they have any realistic like rom com future uh, together. Since <laughs> he's a damaged man who's been alone for fifty years, yeah, but yeah. he's got a, he's going to need some good therapy yeah. before he can have a meaningful relationship. I would yeah, think. Yeah, but Catherine's going to take care of him. She's a she's she a she's a well off lady, and she's going to take care of him the rest of his life. I think. I think you're probably right. <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was a really good episode. It made me laugh at many points, yeah. so it was. I found it quite amusing and funny at times. But then also, yeah, there was that that sweet story, and I'm not typically one for romance stories, actually. But I thought that it was a pretty cute storyline there. I thought it was an interesting take and some kind of foreshadowing that there's going to be a bunch of powerful, powerful <laughs> but good and positive races that we might be running into in the future. Yeah with all of the implications of like having four different languages and these being supposedly good and benevolent beings rather than evil like the Gwold. So so yeah, some good story building and character building and and some funny times too. I thought it was a good yeah. episode. I enjoyed it. Yeah. It's yeah. good stuff. Mm -hmm. What do we have coming up next? Oh, it's looking a good question. Right. We have Bloodlines. Oh. That was a good show on Netflix. I liked that show. I don't know anything about that show. What's that show? It was about, like, this really... This family that was, like, super dedicated to each other, but, like, they they were dedicated to the family line and the family name, but then they were all doing, like, stab-in-the-backy kinds of stuff to each other, and there were crimes and Ooh. trying to... And crimes and murder, and it was good. I enjoyed it. Nice. I won't give away too much in case anyone hasn't watched it and wants to. Sounds sounds reasonable. Yep. Well, this episode doesn't look like it has anything to do with that. <laughs> I'm going to keep reading from the DVD booklet because it seems to give away less than the Wikipedia descriptions. Okay. Although they yeah, both probably good. They're both just descriptions of the thing, not like teasers. With the proviso that he bring back a gold larva for study, Teal'c returns to Chulak to stop the gold from enslaving his son, Ryak. Ooh. Trouble is, Ryak needs a larva to survive, and the only one available is Teal'c's. Teal'c has a son. What? Apparently so. Oh my god. He is the man of many secrets. He is. It's because he doesn't speak. <laughs> <laughs> only when he has something important to say. Yes. And, you know, revealing you have family is not important. Yes. <laughs> Why would you bother to mention no. that? No. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. All right. Yeah. So we'll find out what that's all about. Yeah. So we'll be talking about that in a couple weeks. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to us on Apple or Google or Spotify or whatever podcast catcher is your preferred. We're on pretty much all of them by now and we release every other Monday. We're also on YouTube on that same release day schedule. Reviews are greatly appreciated to help other people find our podcast as well. And please be nice and give us five stars. You can contact us on email at S-T-A-R-G-A-T-E-Z-I-N-G. That's stargatesing at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at stargatesing. 
You can also find us on Facebook. You can like our page or join our new Facebook group. And because this is a labor of love for both of us, we appreciate any generous donations uh, that you might like to make over at patreon.com slash stargatesing. Those donations go to help us cover our production costs because this is not actually a free endeavor for us. And we have our awesome, amazing website at stargatesing.space. You have been listening to Stargatesing. I am Mary. I am Kathy. The end. The end. Langford or Langdon? I always thought it was Langford. Let's check that real quick. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I had Langdon written down and I might be wrong. Now that you're saying it, I think that you're probably right and I'm probably wrong on that. As it should always be. I'd like to figure out for sure. (laughs) I'd like to figure out for sure, just in case. (laughs) Yeah, it is Langford. Okay. Woo! I win! Yeah! I do win! (laughs) It's the most winning I've done in, you know, years. Oh, that's sad. Because it's not a very big win. (laughs) No, it's not. (laughs) 